Section 31 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Chong Link. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2. Section 31. Essay on Arago, by Edward S. Holden. Dominique Francois Arago, 1786 to 1853, by Edward S. Holden. Dominique Francois Arago was born February 26, 1786, near Perpignan, in the Eastern Pyrenees, where his father held the position of treasurer of the mint. He entered the École Polytechnique in Paris after a brilliant examination and held the first places throughout the course. In 1806 he was sent to Valencia in Spain and to the neighboring island of Aviza to make the astronomical observations for prolonging the arc of the meridian from Dunkirk southward in order to supply the basis for the metric system. Here begin his extraordinary adventures which are told with inimitable spirit and vigor in his autobiography. Arago's work required him to occupy stations on the summits of the highest peaks in the mountains of southeastern Spain. The peasants were densely ignorant and hostile to all foreigners, so that an escort of troops was required in many of his journeys. At some stations he made friends of the bandits of the neighborhood and carried on his observations under their protection, as it were. In 1807, the tribunal of the Inquisition existed in Valencia, and Arago was witness to the trial and punishment of a pretended sorceress. And this, as he says, in one of the principal towns of Spain, the seat of a celebrated university, yet the worst criminals lived unmolested in the cathedrals, for the right of asylum was still in force. His geodetic observations were mysteries to the inhabitants, and his signals on the mountain top were believed to be part of the work of a French spy. Just at this time, hostilities broke out between France and Spain, and the astronomer was obliged to flee, disguised as a Majorcan peasant, carrying his precious papers with him. His knowledge of the Majorcan language saved him, and he reached a Spanish prison with only a slight wound from a dagger. It is the first recorded instance, he says, of a fugitive flying to a dungeon for safety. In this prison, under the care of Spanish officers, Arago found sufficient occupation in calculating observations which he had made. In reading the recounts in the Spanish journals of his own execution at Valencia, and in listening to rumors that it was proposed by a Spanish monk to do away with the French prisoner by poisoning his food. The Spanish officer in charge of the prisoners was induced to connive at the escape of Arago and M. Berthamy, an aide-de-camp of Napoleon, and on the 28th of July, 1808, they stole away from the coast of Spain in a small boat with three sailors, and arrived at Algiers on the 3rd of August. Here the French consul procured them two false passports, which transformed the Frenchmen into strolling merchants from Schwicat and Lubin. They boarded an Algerian vessel and set off. Let Arago describe the crew and cargo. The vessel belonged to the Emir of Seca. The commander was a Greek captain named Spiro Caligiro. Among the passengers were five members of the family, superseded by the Bakri as kings of the Jews, two Moroccan ostrich feather merchants, Captain Krog from Bergen in Norway, Two lions sent by the day of Algiers as presents to the Emperor Napoleon, and a great number of monkeys. As they entered the Gulf de Lyon, their ship was captured by a Spanish corsair and taken to Rosas. Worst of all, a former Spanish servant of Aragos, Pablo, was a sailor in the corsair's crew. At Rosas, the prisoners were brought before an officer for interrogation. It was now Aragos' turn. The officer begins. Who are you? A poor travelling merchant. From whence do you come? From a country where you certainly have never been. Well, from what country? I feared to answer, 
for the passport, steeped in vinegar to prevent infection, were in the officer's hands, and I had entirely forgotten whether I was from Schwekart or from Lyuben. Finally, I answered at a chance, I am from Schwekart. Fortunately, this answer agreed with the passport. You're from Schwekart about as much as I am, said the officer. You're a Spaniard, and a Spaniard from Valencia to boot, as I can tell by your accent. Sir, you are inclined to punish me simply because I have by nature the gift of languages. I readily learn the dialects of the various countries where I carry on my trade. For example, I know the dialect of Avisa. Well, I will take you at your word. Here is a soldier who comes from Avisa. Talk to him. Very well. I will even sing the goat song. The verses of this song, if one may call them verses, are separated by the imitated bleatings of the goat. I began at once, with an audacity which even now astonishes me to intone the song which all the shepherds in Avisa sing. Ah, graciada signora, una canzo boyul canta, be, 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 no sera gaiva pulida, no se si vos agradara, be, 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 be. Upon which my Avisa avouches in tears that I am certainly from Avisa. The song had affected him as a Switzer is affected by the Rans de Vache. I then said to the officer that if he would bring me a person who could speak French, he would find the same embarrassment in this case also. An emigre of the Bourbon regiment comes forward for the new experiment, and after a few phrases, affirms without hesitation that I am surely a Frenchman. The officer begins to be impatient. Have done with these trials, they prove nothing. I require you to tell me who you are. My foremost desire is to find an answer which will satisfy you. I am the son of the innkeeper at Mataro. I know that man. You are not his son. You are right. I told you that I should change my answers till I found one to suit you. I am a marionette player from Lerida. A huge laugh from the crowd which had listened to the interrogatory put an end to the questioning. Finally, it was necessary for Arago to declare outright that he was French, and to prove it by his old servant Pablo. To supply his immediate wants, he sold his watch, and by a series of misadventures, this watch subsequently fell into the hands of his family, and he was mourned in France as dead. After months of captivity, the vessel was released, and the prisoners set out from Marseilles. A fearful tempest drove them to the harbour Bouja, an African port a hundred miles east of Algiers. Thence they made the perilous journey by land to their place of starting, and finally reached Marseilles eleven months after their voyage began. Eleven months to make a journey of four days! The intelligence of the safe arrival, after so many perils of the young astronomer with his packet of precious observations, soon reached Paris. He was welcomed with effusion. Soon afterward, at the age of twenty-three years, he was elected a member of the section of astronomy of the Academy of Sciences, and from this time forth he led the peaceful life of a savant. He was the director of the Paris Observatory for many years, the friend of all European scientists, the ardent patron of young men of talent, a leading physicist, a strong Republican, though the friend of Napoleon, and finally the perpetual secretary of the Academy. In the latter capacity, it was part of his duty to prepare eloge of deceased academicians, of his collected works in fourteen volumes, Oeuvre de François Arago, published in Paris, 1865. Three volumes are given to these notices biographiques. Here may be found the biographies of Bailly, Sir William Herschel, Laplace, Joseph Fourier, Carnot, Malice, Fresnel, Thomas Young and James Watt, which translated rather callously into English, have been published under the title Biographies of Distinguished Men, and can be found in the larger libraries. The collected works contain biographies also of Ampere, Condorite, Volta, Monge, Porson, Gay-Lussac, 
besides shorter sketches. They are masterpieces of style and of clear scientific exposition and full of generous appreciation of others' work. They present in a lucid and popular form the achievements of scientific men whose works have changed the accepted opinion of the world, and they give general views not found in the original writings themselves. Scientific men are usually too much engrossed in advancing science to spare time for expounding it to popular audiences. The talent for such exposition is itself a special one. Arago possessed it to the full, and his own original contributions to astronomy and physics enabled him to speak as an expert, not merely as an expositor. The extracts are from his admirable estimate of Laplace, which he prepared in connection with the proposal before him and other members of a state committee to publish a new and authoritative edition of the great astronomer's works. The translation is mainly that of the biographies of distinguished men cited above, and much of the felicity of style is necessarily lost in translation, but the substance of solid and lucid exposition from a master's hand remains. Arago was a deputy in 1830 and minister of war in the provisional government of 1848. He died, full of honours, October 2nd, 1853. Two of his brothers, Jacques and Etienne, were dramatic authors of note. Another, Jean, was a distinguished general in the service of Mexico. One of his sons, Alfred, is favorably known as a painter. Another, Emmanuel, as a lawyer, deputy, and diplomat. End of section 31. Recording by Tina Jong Link.